Let me present our first panelist and say a couple of words about Martin. So Martin Grzebieluch is the Master of Engineering in Computer Science from the Wrocław University of Technology, software architect in uh, Quigen. Martin Grzebieluch is mostly interested in Linux, distributed computing, machine learning, uh, performance and C++. I'm not surprised. In his spare time, he plays with electronics and contributes to open source projects. If you ask me if he has some experience in this field, I mean being here, I'll tell you that he has got a past presentation, the worst feature of modern C++, default behavior from 2017. But today, he will be the first presenter to go with C++20 coroutines. And actually, he's going to give us some introduction. And the last word from me, I will tell you that he has already got his record right here in this cinema because he crossed so many times that he probably hit the record for his steps in this cinema. I don't know whether you will be able to do that, but please give a warm applause to Martin Grzebieluch, C++20 coroutines introduction. Thank you. One, two, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Martin. I already have been introduced, so enough of that. So. As I, uh, as it's already been told, I am a soft professional software developer for several years, and also since the beginning of this year, thanks to generosity of the C SII company, I am member of C++ uh, standard committee. They have this beautiful uh, habit of sponsoring the passions of their employees. So my. Uh, particular interest is the C++ language and I always wanted to see how the language is created from the kitchen so they allowed me to participate in C++ standard uh, committee. Okay, so today I am here to talk about coroutines and first give me your hand who is, al who is already aware what a coroutine is in any, C++, uh, any language. Okay, so I can close out first section. Who is uh, familiar with C++ coroutines that will land in C++20? Okay, a bit more. What are you doing here? This is the introduction. So we will firstly introduce what the coroutine is and why do we need it. So for most of them, it will be not particularly interesting. Okay, this one works. And now, then we will deep dive into what compiler do for us when we create a coroutine. And then, because we are kind of unfortunate in C++20, only the core language feature lands and we don't have a standard library with basic coroutine types, we will try to implement basic coroutine type to use it in our code. Okay, so I want to share with you one thing. I'm extremely stressed right, right now, so to uh, focus you on the slides instead of me, I, I pasted a lot of code to the presentation, so please keep focus. Okay, so first thing, we need to define what coroutines are for. And as I already as already been told as you already been told I am particularly interested in distributed computing so usually I end up in the uh, in the applications that do a lot of asynchronous IO operations networking databases access etc etc and I have an example of small application that is doing this heavy IO for you so first we will define the main loop on my our program so we will have some thread pool and uh, forever and ever we will receive some messages from our users that uh, this receive function will return me a session that uh, allows me to return the pardon oh it's dry so it allows me to uh, return a response to our user and the data they want me to calculate. Okay, then I execute, uh, I move all the data I received to a lambda and I perform the experiment, whatever the experiment is. And the exper uh, first implementation of my experiment will be actually blocking, so no asynchronity introduced to my functions yet. So I basically uh, get the experiment the data and the session for response. I will create a vector uh, for of results because uh, each experiment is consists of, uh, of chunk of samples. So I will call 
uh, worker analyze that is network call to some application uh, at the back end on, of my whole system. And every time worker returns some response, I will populate my vector of results. I will then, at the end of the function, send the response back to the user. And OK, we have this uh, application that is in the middle here. So we have our user that is sending responses. And I have a bunch of workers, somewhere different applications that I send network requests to. And what is the problem with this implementation? So first of all, it is extremely blocking. So every time I ask worker to do something, I block the whole thread and waiting for the response. And only when the worker responses, uh, responded me with the uh, uh, result of the calculation, I end up having the uh, executing the next worker. So even a single request from a user is done sequential, not in parallel, uh, even though it could be basing on the architecture of my system. So C++, even before coroutines, allowed me to do some modification that I will make my code more asynchronous without sacrificing too much readability. This is important for me. So I will introduce the uh, IO thread under the hood of the application. And now, every time I uh, call worker analyze, I will push the, the uh, work to actual IO thread that is under the hood in my application. This IO thread will return the future for me. I will then be able to block on that future to get the response. And uh, in, in parallel, IO thread will send the request to the worker. And after, worker, after some time when worker responds to me, uh, the future will be set to finish so that I will be able to unblock my working thread and get the data. So this allows me to ask multiple uh, workers at once to perform the calculation. So let's implement it. Again, this time I need the vector of futures. I need to create all the futures, so I am scheduling all the requests to our workers. Then I have, a, uh, again, vector of results. I'm collecting all the data from my futures uh, that is response uh, that is response from the workers, and then I send the response to my user. And this may uh, seem pretty nice, but it still has one significant problem. So I am handling multiple requests from multiple users. And to, in order to have uh, this function called uh, for every user, I need as many threads, as many requests I want to handle in parallel. So in, in practice, all the threads that are executing executing perform experiment is basically waiting for the responses from the worker. And it, if the work for in the worker is particularly lengthy, uh, it means that all my application is doing is waiting for the responses. And I need uh, several threads that are just waiting on the mutexes for the response. So my application looks more or less like this. OK, so you can already guess that this is not particularly good design. And it probably can be easily improved using, for example, some callback uh, mechanisms like async.io. Async.io is a networking library for C++, and it's mostly based on callbacks. So I, every time I ask that I want to receive some data from anything, I will give the callback that will be called once the data is received. But this is not the solution I am particularly interested in, because it requires me to uh, break my code down to some artificial fun functions that are uh, forced on me, not because of the code read readability, but just because of the uh, requirement of the framework. So what I want to achieve, I want to get rid of all these IO threads. I don't want to have some threads blocking just because they are waiting for some work. I, and I don't want to sacrifice readability. In especially, I don't want to force myself to write some artificial functions just to handle uh, interface requirement. So this is when, where I believe coroutines can hand, help me. You already uh, told me that you know what the coroutine is. And let me see if I uh, know about coroutines, the same things 
you think you know. So what is the coroutine? And be be before we start uh, talking about coroutines, let's uh, talk about something slightly simpler, the subroutine, because coroutine is basically a generalization of the, uh, of the subroutine. And I believe that all Almost all of us in this uh, room, at least all of us who are programmers, n already know what a subroutine is, because subroutine is also known to us as a function. So we know how function works. Yeah, We define a function, we execute some code into it, we return some values from the function, then we have some other functions, the functions can call other functions, and also return some values. So how it looks in the abstract machine of uh, C++. So once we start execution of our function main, we will create a function uh, frame on the stack, the stack frame from function mine, and we will uh, need to have some space on this stack for local variables and arguments of this function. Then, once execution of our function reaches the point where it calls other function, we will call, uh, we will create additional uh, function stack. And uh, same story as before. In this function stack, we need this place for all the arguments, and we need this for all the local arguments. One hour once our function finishes execution, we will uh, return value and destroy the, the, the stack frame. And the same story for the main function. One, once it uh, reaches end of the execution, it also uh, deletes the stack frame. So this is what we can do using a function. Uh, at least this is what is done when we call a function. So first of all, with function, what we can do? We can create a stack frame for a function. We can execute this particular function code. We can return a value and we can delete a stack frame. So there are two uh, additional actions that coroutines introduced to us. So coroutine can perform exactly the same stuff, but two more. First action will be the suspension of the execution, and the second action will be resuming the execution. Okay, end of story, we know what the coroutine is, we can go home. So let's implement some coroutine in C++ using some, for now, some magic types. I will later show you how we can implement it and what they are used for. So first I said that coroutine can be suspended and resumed. So we need, we no longer return, uh, we no longer can return the direct return value to our user, we need to res uh, return to him something that allows us to perform these two actions, resuming and suspension. And this is called coroutine inf interface type. And one of the such interface types can be task. And task is a single, simple type of, cor of coroutine, so once it's created, it is immediately suspended, doesn't perform any action, and then once we resume it, it will per uh, execute some code. If it uh, reaches the point when it is ordered to be suspended, it will suspend or it will reach the end of the execution. End of story. So we have the uh, function body. Uh, this is a function body, not a coroutine body. And to tell a compiler that we want to have a coroutine body, we will need to use one of the coroutine related keywords that got introduced uh, into C20. And one of these keywords is coreturn. I don't want to even talk about why this is a coreturn. The nice thing that uh, we have that we have no longer co uh, new context-dependent keyword in C++. We would, I know we all love it, but for coroutines we have no context-dependent keywords. So the cur return can be used only in context of coroutine and can, at least for this release, and uh, can and indicates that it returns from the coroutine. Additional information that the key keywords uh, gives us, because this is different than returning from the function, because returning from the function immediately means we need to delete the stack frame for this function. In terms of coroutines, it, it the coroutine cur doesn't imply that, so the coroutine stack frame, coroutine frame, excuse me, uh, can still be uh, reachable after the coroutine. OK, so now how the usage of this coroutine will look like. So we have the 
uh, call to our func uh, we used to have call to our function, but it's not returning the re result right now, so we changed the type. Uh, so we have this interface type uh, back from the call to the foo, and we can no longer return it because it is not an int. So I, as I said, it will not uh, calculate the result immediately, so we need to resume our coroutine, and then we can return the result. Okay, so far it's good. So I said that we can uh, suspend coroutine multiple times. So let's add additional suspend point into our coroutine. This is done by additional uh, operation called co-await. So co-await can mean a lot of things. And, uh, it depends on what the parameter of co-await is. In this term, co-await uh, co gets a suspend always awaiter, and this awaiter means that you need to suspend our execution immediately. And this one is in the standard library. Okay, so now we have two suspend points uh, of our coroutine at the very beginning, at its creation, and after uh, and the one that we explicitly placed in our code. So we need to resume it twice. But, but from the user of the task, I don't know how many times I might need to resume. So I also will implement for my task a mean to check whether the coroutine body is finished, so whether it's reached the end of the coroutine. Uh, so I can, while not ready, I can continue to execute my coroutine. Okay, so what we got next? Okay, the full body, and now let's see, let's analyze the stack the same way as we done for our functions. So we have a, a fun uh, the same code as before, only smaller, and uh, we will draw some uh, stack frames. So first we have a stack frame for our function main, and this time instead of a uh, variable uh, X, we have a structure that co uh, that have somewhere in it the coroutine handle. And this coroutine handle is used to interface with the code that was generated by compiler for our coroutine. And when we call a function foo, we no longer execute the coroutine body, we will just uh, call the constructor for our coroutine. So these two arguments will be used for creating our coroutine. So now we have created the coroutine frame somewhere. It may be on the stack. Uh, it may be on the heap. It depends on the compiler uh, what compiler can do and how our coroutine interface type is implemented. And then we, ca we can return. So now the X has access to this coroutine frame. Now, while we executing the coroutine, we will at some point run the resume, which is the member function of the X, so it also has access to this coroutine handle, and it can uh, call uh, some special uh, magical function that comp compiler created for us during coroutine transformation. So it will call something from coroutine frame, I will call this function S from suspend point, and by X I mean a number. So at first, uh, when we first time call the, suspens uh, the resume, we will call the first suspension from the coroutine. So it will execute a part of our code. In this part, in this case, it will be uh, line two, and then it will reach the suspension point, so it will immediately return and uh, delete the stack frame of the result. And now, once I, sorry, once I resume, uh, call resume the second time, it will call the second part of the coroutine again after the finish of this function. It will return, uh, it will change some state of the uh, coroutine handle, coroutine frame, and we will end the execution of function main. So when once we reach the execution of uh, main, we will call the destructor for our task, and this destructor will destroy the coroutine frame. Okay, so this is how it looks from the stack, but I already mentioned some magical stuff that I will need to explain to uh, reason about this stuff. Okay, this is supposed to be a joke, but it's not a good one, so let's skip it. Uh, okay, so what is the takeaway from this section? So first of all, we have a coroutine that is generalization of the function. So uh, it can be suspended and resumed, and suspending and resuming in C++ 
unlike in some other languages, is extremely fast because due to all the transformation that compiler done for us, coroutine calls are just a function calls, and compilers are extremely good at optimizing the function calls. So we can, at the day one, apply all the opt optimization techniques that are implemented in, cor in uh, compilers for our coroutines. And then creating a coroutine uh, may require some uh, memory allocation due to the fact that now the life uh, timeline of the coroutine stack, uh, coroutine frame, is separated from our stack and can be passed uh, to other functions or whatever or stored somewhere in the dynamic memory, we sometimes may need to outlive the stack, therefore we may need to perform the allocation to create a coroutine frame. And coroutines are stackless. So as I, s as I showed you, the coroutines will just use a stack out of my uh, of my thread that I am executing right now. So every time I'm resuming a uh, coroutine, I'm just executing functions on my current uh, stack. So no magical context switching required here. Okay, so let's. Uh, I, I mentioned something magical called coroutine transformation, and we'll let's dig into it to understand really what coroutine is in C++. And after analyzing this part of code, I hope we will all have intuition what the coroutine I really is. So we have the coroutine that have two suspend points, uh, two explicit suspend points, and uh, some uh, code in between them. So when compiler faces some coroutine-related uh, keywords, it will deduce that this function body is indeed coroutine body, so we'll begin coroutine transformation. So first of all, it will look at the signature of our function and will uh, create our uh, coroutine frame. And this coroutine frame is just a type that has some data members and some functions under the hood. So first of all, we need a place to store our arguments passed to coroutine, because as I said, we will create a coroutine and immediately suspend. So when once we resume our coroutine execution, we need to have these arguments that we passed earlier stored somewhere. So we need to push the argument to the stack to the curtain frame. Now we will face the first part of the code up until the suspend point and we will generate this magical function for the particular part of the curtain that has to be executed. So we will generate the magical function called S1. It doesn't have a name in, in fact in, cur in compiler but I need to uh, put something here and put the code that is uh, in this curtain up until this point. And then we will analyze the co-await and we will see that the variable that was introduced in this part of the function is used after the suspension point. So it cannot be local for my uh, S1 function because then I cannot reuse it after in the next function I will generate for next suspend point. So I need to push it also as a member of coroutine frame. Then I will create uh, the next part of code that will be executed after the, after the coroutine is again resumed. So we have some code here and we have some more code, so we will push it there. And now we again introducing new variable, so we are scanning the coroutine body whether it is used across suspension points. And it is indeed, so we need again push the C uh, as a coroutine, uh, as a member of the coroutine frame. And the last part we are left with, we will need to somehow uh, execute code for coreturn at the third susp after the first, uh, second suspension point. So we need to generate a code that will return for our coroutine. And as I said, uh, coroutine, that there can be multiple types of coroutines and it is left for the library implementers to implement this type. So we need to a way for these uh, library implementers to allow them to modify how the coroutines will behave. So this weird type that uh, magically appeared here is the promise type and the promise type is somehow the interface for the compiler to our coroutine. 
And now compiler know that it has to use this interface to execute the coreturn. So in fact, every time we have a coreturn in our coroutine body, in fact, we will calling the return value function from the promise type that is implemented by a developer. And soon, probably for in C++ 23 or 20, uh, 24 or 28, we will have this one in the uh, 23, excuse me, and 26. We, will, we maybe have these uh, classes implemented for us in standard library. Okay. So take away here is the curating body is a magical type that is generated by a compiler during the process that is called curating transformation. And each suspend point might end up as a separate function call. Might end up because not every suspend point will need to suspend. In fact, this is due to uh, compiler can optimize a lot of this code away. Uh, and now I mentioned some magical types, the task type and the promise type. So let's take a look and implement one or two to have finally be able to fully use a coroutines. So, okay, implementing a coroutine. I mentioned interface type and I mentioned promise type. And in fact, this is a tool that we need to uh, implement. So let's get ahead and start with a interface type that will be exposed to our user. So first of all, we need to implement the class. Then we need to provide a compiler the way of creating the, pro uh, the promise type, which will be used as an interface. So we will need to have some member class that is called promise type. It is just specified that this is the way you specify that this is uh, our promise type. We will take a look into implementation on the further slide. Then we will need to have for the compiler the means to construct our interface type out of this magically created coroutine frame. So coroutine handle, you can think of it as just a pointer to this type generated by a compiler, this coroutine body. And then we will have a destructor. So as I said, once we reach the end of the execution, we want to destroy this coroutine handle, uh, this coroutine uh, frame. So we will reach the handle destroy. And of course, we need to store this handle. And now to the promise type, because this is the one that is particularly uh, interesting, because this is the one uh, that is specifying behavior of our coroutine. So we have a structure promise that have get return object function. This is just a boilerplate. This is a means of converting the promise type to the interface type. And we have a helper function in standard library for that. So in my experience, we are usually just copy pasting this code between a uh, promise type that we are implementing. Then we have finally some means to specify how our coroutine shall behave when we create it in execution. Uh, so initial suspend is a function that tells compiler what to do once the coroutine is created. So we can, for example, suspend always, and that basically means this is how our task is implemented. So we create a coroutine and we don't execute any code, just return to the caller. We can uh, put it there, suspend never, and then we will execute some code up until the first suspend point we are facing in the coroutine body. Same story for the final suspend. So the final suspend is just a specification what to do when coroutine finishes its execution. If we don't suspend here, the coroutine frame will be deleted. And we don't want to do it because we want to leave our user the way to extract the value from the coroutine that was calculated. And now we specify what the function shall do on some kind of return. We saw already that compiler will gen generate the code for uh, return value. For this slide, just for the means of simplicity, I specify that my coroutine can only return void. So no value returned from the coroutine. So no coroutine can appear with a parameter in my coroutine body. And then I will specify how I want my exceptions to be handled. Because C++ word is divided into two uh, subwords, one that use uh, one that don't use exceptions and one that use C++ according to the standard. So we want to allow to all allow all the users to 
use the coroutines, and if someone doesn't want to handle exceptions, we can, uh, he can specify this unhandled exceptions function, whatever we, he wants. Okay, so we have a, a coroutine that is already somehow implementable, so we can use this task and write some code, suspend, and write some more code. I can even use coreturn, but without a parameter, if I want to return a uh, value from my coroutine, I will get a nice uh, compilation error that I didn't provide the return value function implementation from my coroutine for the parameter of type int, so my, uh, so my compiler doesn't know what to do it with it, so my pro program is ill-formed. So let's implement our uh, coroutine the way that it can return, a uh, return a v any value. So let's get rid of all the boilerplate that we already uh, implemented. We will not touch it anymore for now. So now we will get back to our promise and we uh, add a template to it because we want to return different types basing on wha what we specify in the function signature. We will uh, need some space to store this value and we will need to change our return uh, void to return value function. And at this point we will have our coroutine basically able to return value. Now we need to leave a user, uh, give a user a ability to extract this value after the coroutine finishes the calculation. So we, this is the full implementation of the promise. If you want to copy paste it to your code for the test, this code compiles and works. So uh, now the task. Same story, get rid of the boilerplate from the slide. And for the interface type, we also need to make it templated because now it didn't compile after the change we introduced to promise because promise requires the template argument. So we add template argument everywhere we used a promise. And now we will implement the function value that will return the calculated value from our coroutine. So we in the handle we have a way to get uh, access to the promise. This is a promise function and we have we are returning a value from it. Okay, so now I have a means to create a coroutine and return value, but I don't have a means to resume it. So let's get back to our task and implement the way uh, to resume execution of our coroutine. So uh, straightforward, just take a handle and call resume on it. And if I want to check if our coroutine is ready, then same story, I'm just asking whether the coroutine body is done. So we have right now fully functional uh, coroutine type. We did it, we are happy, we can go ahead and implement our coroutines. And one particularly interesting example, this is not my idea, this is some paper that I read about usage uh, experiments uh, of usage in coroutines in huge databases. The idea is basically that we have some, oh, this is the recap, so I, I assume that you already know everything, so let's go. Uh, the particular interesting uh, usage of such simple coroutine will be that we have some data in our database and it is stored somewhere in RAM and we are not using it extremely uh, frequent. So basically, it, there is extremely small chance that we will have this in the cache during the execution. And uh, we have some cost uh, calculations done on this data after it is uh, loaded, so we can implement a coroutine called prefetched execution. We will pass a pointer to the data that we want this execution to be performed onto, so we will prefetch and immediately suspend. Then the user is able to call a another prefetched execution on other data that he will that he knows that he will be need to calculate later and during this time he creates other coroutine or executing other coroutines we give our processor time to prefetch this data to cache to minimize the risk of the cache miss and th then we perform the calculation once the user resumes us uh, again so fully functional coroutine that can already be used in our code 
okay, I showed you the coroutine that is just a uh, executing and returning value, but coroutines have a syntactic sugar for returning multiple values from uh, from it. This is called yielding, and the generators it's very frequently used if we have access to coroutines. In example, in Python, most of the coroutines we are writing is actually generators. So let's uh, see how the generator can be used. So we have a co uh, coroutine called generator, and this coroutine is going through the numbers from 0 to, uh, to 10, and each uh, loop uh, execution will yield a value. So uh, basically, how we want to use it, and this uh, interface is not extremely nice because I am lazy. So we have a, a creation of the coroutine. We already know how to do it. We need some optional because once uh, my coroutine ends uh, the function body, it can no longer uh, generate a new value. So I need mean to uh, tell that I. I'm out of value from this generator. So uh, once I reach the end of the coroutine body, I will return the empty optional. So now I'm getting in the loop each value from the coroutine and break the loop once the value is, opti uh, is empty optional. And if there is some value, I'm printing it. So some simple usage of the generator. So let's implement this generator because unfortunately we don't have the one in the standard library. So we have a oh one more uh, particularly interesting uh, usage of the generator. So generator of the Fibonacci number. So we have a uh, two member function, two members that will represent two last Fibonacci numbers. Then forever and ever, we are yielding the last value that we calculated. This time, the one at the first time, the one we calculated is the hard-coded one. And then after the coroutine is resumed, we will uh, calculate the next one and, uh, and move the two, two values that we have cached to the next one. And basically, every time we calculate it, we update the state of the coroutine so it will f uh, go through all the Fibonacci numbers up until int max and then undefined behavior. So I know, you, you know, you see new way to implement yet another Fibonacci number generator you, and you are immediately want your uh, coroutine this way uh, embedded in your... God, I burned that joke. Okay, go go forward. So we have a generator. So let's implement the generator coroutine. So we have a, again, we need an interface type. We have a, a promise type, same, uh, same boilerplate that we used for our uh, task. So promise type, coroutine handle, constructor from coroutine handle and destructor. Nothing new, so copy paste here. And then we have our interface function, get next. So we have this function, so first we do, we are resuming the coroutine to calculate some value, then we will check if the coroutine body is done. If it's done, then we return empty optional, and if not, um, uh, if, not empty, uh, if not done, then we will return current value from our promise. So now we just need to make uh, our promise for the generator, and this is uh, this differs almost n in no means from the promise we already implemented. So uh, place for the value, calculated value, initial and final suspend. We want to our coroutine to suspend immediately after creation. We don't want our values calculated yet. Then we will have unhandled exceptions. Also, I terminate here because uh, yeah, my code doesn't throw exceptions and doesn't have any bugs. So now get random or object, uh, get return object, same uh, boilerplate code. And now the interesting part, the yielding value. So we tell compiler what to do on uh, facing co-yield. So we are assigning the calculated value from the co-yield to our coroutine. Um, to our current value, and we say that after co uh, after you face co yield, you want to immediately suspend. In some cases, you may want to do some other stuff, but in our simple generator, we just want to immediately suspend. And our generator doesn't return any uh, 
and new values. So we are basically done through it. And now we can implement even more generators, and this simple generator is already extremely composable. So we can see that take at most n elements from a generator function, a coroutine, that will take other generator and an upper bound of uh, elements, how many elements we want to return. So I go through all the coroutine, uh, all the members uh, from my generator, and this is a bit cheating because under the hood I implement the uh, iteration iterator interface for my generator type that I'm not showing here because too much code but this is extremely easy and nice exercise for a reader to do it on its own so now we will decrease our uh, upper bound value up until we reach zero and every time we didn't reach zero we are yielding if and if we uh, reached the upper, we reached zero before the end of the core, uh, the generator we have been given, we will break the loop. So this is our current uh, generator that is using other generator. And what is nice about it, that it is lazy, so it calculates value only if user ask him for it. And same story with the generator that is given to it. Every time a uh, user calls a function from our generator, the new value is calculated and never before. So if user creates a bunch of generator and combine them together and only is interested in, uh, in every second number of whatever, 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 like uh, ranges, we will only perform the calculations that we need and not generate everything we may think of. Okay, one more uh, example of this composable generator. So we have the generator join that takes two other generators and basically uh, once it returns all the values from one generator, then it starts uh, executing the code from other generators. Okay, so we already know what is the interface type of the coroutine that is allowing us to interface with our coroutines, and we have a, a promise type that allows compiler and uh, that allows us to tell compiler how our coroutine shall behave. And there is one more set of type uh, concept of types that is awaiter type that is passed to the coawait. Uh, expression. We already saw a waiter type like uh, suspend always and suspend never, but uh, there is means why we even need them and why we might want to implement one. So let's imagine uh, that example that we have a coroutine that is suspending. So it prints something and then it suspends. And then we have second coroutine that wants to use that first coroutine. This is called uh, symmetric transfer that coroutines can call other coroutines. And this is perfectly implementable in C++. So now I have my function main, and once I go through all the suspension point of the coroutine composed, I would expect my program to first print hello, then a comma and a space, then word, and then exclamation mark. And if we use simple awaiter, so first of all, we need to have a way to convert the suspending coroutine to an awaiter. This is perfectly implementable and trivial indeed. But if we do every uh, implementation trivially, then what will happen? So let's start with a uh, stack analysis the same way as we used to. So we have stack for uh, main function that have this composed cur uh, th that x composed coroutine. So when why is why w once we called x resume, we are calling coroutine handle, uh, from the coroutine handle that is po pointing to the composed coroutine. Once we call composed coroutine uh, this resume, the composed suspension point one will be called, the suspension point is from the experiment, uh, from, the, from the coroutine transformation we already covered, and then we will have executed code from the first suspension point 
and it will print hello. Then we will face the co await that will supposed to call our coroutine and execute it. So we will go through it. We will call the coroutine suspending. So now our uh, function that is being executed is suspending point S1 and we print the uh, comma and the space. So far, so good. Then we are facing co-return. So we are getting rid of the execution and we are back to uh, our user code. So uh, main returns the execution and uh, we'll call the return once again and uh, resume once again. And once our resume is called again, we expect to have our suspending coroutine to continue the execution and only once execution of suspending coroutine is finished, it will get back to our uh, composed coroutine. But in fact, what our code that trivially implemented uh, will return will be the exclamation mark. And this is due to the fact that coroutine handle in the X object is not pointing to the coroutine uh, suspending, but it's still pointing to the coroutine composed. So we have some basically pretty defined, uh, defined but weird behavior of our coroutines. Okay, so let's analyze how the stack supposed to, not even the stack, but how the pointers to the coroutine handle supposed to behave in the proper execution of such program. So we need that our X uh, to be pointed, uh, pointing, pointed at composed coroutine, this one, once it's created. Then we will check whether it's ready and uh, resume the execution. And once re execution is uh, once execution reaches the uh, co-await suspending, we will want our uh, new coroutine uh, frame to be created and the pointer from X, X reassigned to our new coroutine frame. And I cannot just reassign this coroutine frame because basically it will mean that the C is never resumable anymore. So my suspend suspended coroutine will need somehow to store the uh, coroutine from which it was called so that uh, after the finishing the execution it can reassign the pointers back in the proper way. So uh, see the uh, composed coroutine is on the same time so it's uh, all of the same type so it will also have this continuation pointer somewhere on the stack and once we finish the exec uh, uh, reach suspend point and we resume again we will back uh, we will be back in the proper point of the execution of the coroutine so we can think of it that calling the one task from another is like injecting the state machine into single particular state of other state machine. Because if you think about the coroutine transformation, what compiler creates for us is just a simple state machine that will go through the each uh, suspend point. And once we compose our coroutines, we want to have these state machines to be injectable into one another. This is pretty convoluted at the first glance, but after a while you will get used to it. So the situation is that we finally have it and now I have a confession to make. When I started to making this uh, when I started making this presentation, I assumed that if you copy paste all the code I showed you today, you will be able to uh, get back to my motivational example and uh, rewrite it for usage of the coroutine. Unfortunately, we are missing around half of hour of the presentation to cover that, so we will not implement these awaitable types that will do this pointer reassigning for us, but I promise I will uh, upload the slides that are covering this topic. So, yeah, this is some stuff, and this is my apology for the missing code on, uh, on awaiter types. But getting back to my motivational example, so we used to use additional IO thread for uh, having not uh, having the uh, having my operations done asynchronously, and now 
we will change the whole architecture of the program. I will not want to use threads anymore because I have coroutines. So once I send the response request to my worker, I can suspend the execution and wait for the response from the other thread. And in the meantime, I can execute other coroutines. And one, once I have my uh, responses back, I will resume the coroutine. So this way I will not need to split my function into separate function. Basically compiler will do it for me and my al networking algorithm will still be visible as a single coroutine body. So how it will look like at the interface level? So first of all, we don't no longer returning void. Uh, we are no longer uh, using asynchronous operations that rest returns promises, uh, futures, sorry. We are using the, cur the asynchronous operations that returns other coroutines. And now I have my perform experiment that is coroutine itself. The eager task is a variation of the task I showed you with this all awaiter stuff uh, implemented and also it will execute the code up until uh, suspension point on its creation. I will show you why it's interesting later. So now I instead of having the vector of futures, I will have the vector of my coroutines uh, interface objects that will have uh, that I will call worker task. I will create all the uh, coroutines so the worker analyze now is also returning eager task. And what is in particularly interesting, this is this eager task is important because every time uh, the worker analyze is done a way that it starts execution, sends, uh, sends the request to a uh, to worker, and then immediately suspends. So I want to I want this first part of the coroutine executed immediately on creation. Then I have a again vector for our results, and now I just pushing the, uh, the result from the co-await because I implement the uh, awaiter type that I didn't show you that uh, basically returns the value from the execution of whole coroutine after the suspension point. And then we will co-await also respond to our users. So what we can use coroutine onto and uh, coroutines for and what is particularly interested to me. So we have IO access that is blocking and can be uh, suspended. We have networking, we have access to this. This is basically an IO, but I wanted to have more points. Inter-process uh, inter communication, databases, all of these interfaces can be now rewritten into coroutine to allow user to do stuff in between uh, waiting for the data. And other uh, things we can do with coroutine, like with everything in C++, we can abuse them. So one I uh, showed, one use case I showed you was already this prefetching uh, example. The second one we already saw that I showed you that the coroutine to work properly, they have to be organized in some kind of linked list, so that the execution of it behaves like a queue and uh, if we can implement linked list using the coroutine stacks so maybe we can implement other data structures like a binary trees or graphs whatever so whatever we imagine just for fun and now i'm finished and i open for questions thank you big applause marcin grzebialuch a very nice start so high five Thank you very much. Guys, uh, we're having three minutes just to ask any questions. If you would like to ask one, please come up to me right here. I'll give you the microphone and you'll be the one to be the first. So I'm happy to see one person. What's your name? Boris. Okay, so feel free to speak up to the microphone. Uh, hi. Thank you, hi. Hello. Uh, a question, uh, could we go back to the slide, coroutine transformation, right in the middle of the whole presentation, I believe. Okay. Get back so I can see it also. There is around of 300 points in this <laughs> presentation, so. We are close. A great idea with highlighting particular lines. I, I like it. <laughs> okay, close. Yeah, we are. Yeah, that's right. So on the left side, uh, we have 
an argument int a passed to, yep. to the function, but also coroutines in C++ are stackless, right? Yeah. So, uh, but we also have co-awaits, so there are some suspension points in the coroutine, but a is an automatic variable, right? So, well, between the suspension points, its value is not saved, is that correct? It's not. This is why at the very first step on the transformation, we generate the constructor of this coroutine frame that the value A will be given to and it will be immediately stored on the coroutine frame. So once we go across suspension point, we have this value A is not referring to this one, it is referring to the one on the coroutine frame. Right, but you will agree that you know the addresses of this automatic variable A and the member of a struct are different, right? Yeah, they are. So actually what happens is uh, well, th that's a question. I'm not aware of this. The co-weight generates some boilerplate code that when uh, we move across suspension points, the automatic variable A on the stack will be, you know, assign a value from A from this struct, right? Uh, so this is very interesting question, and I'm I read through all the uh, wording through C++ standard regarding coroutine, and I don't know about any addresses transformation. So this is something to be investigated, to be honest. So okay, so no idea well, here. if if I can put it more simply, how does it happen that the A from function, the local automatic variable, gets the value that it's saved in the struct? How does it happen? So. This is just, uh, in this point, we will, uh, <coughs> depending on the signature of our coroutine, because we can mo be moving some structure into it, etc., etc. so it will be required to, in this case, it will be a simple, single copy, a simple copy of the value. Okay, uh, one more simpler question this yeah. time. Uh, you mentioned you do el electronics. Do you also do embedded programming? Not too much. Okay. I so used so I to do some. Did you investigate the uh, use of coroutines in embedded environment? I myself not, but there are uh, uses of the coroutines in the embedded software uh, that is uh, created for uh, accelerating certain calculations, like executors of uh, the C++ code on the different hardware. There is a company that is extremely active in the C++ standard committee. I don't remember the, their name. And they are, uh, were performing the investigation whether the keratin can be used, and they can. Because you can write your keratins the way that it will not, it may not require the compilation, uh, the, the allocation and does not use exceptions and basically it ends up as a state machine that just calls a functions. So I don't need to have uh, support for exceptions enabled? No, All right. no you that don't. Thank you, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thanks. <laughs>